back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by novelist Sal Jemmy. How are you doing today, man? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, dude, this is an honor for me. Um, Sal's newest novel, The Demon, the Dumbwaiter, and the Douchebag, is doing really well critically, getting great reviews, and for what I've read of it, I'm really digging it as well. Um, he also just recently turned in his latest novel to his publisher and is currently finishing up on his first book with a middle-grade horror series. Um, all the links are in description, so you can follow him on social media, as well as you can check these out. Now, I want to talk real quick before we get started about The Demon, the Dumbwaiter, and the Douchebag. What was your influence for writing this? Oh, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, when I first started getting ready to write it, I was, um, I had this idea of this apartment complex where all these weird characters are in and the demon is kind of taking over. And um, I wanted it to be kind of like a, um, like a metaphor for Dante's Inferno. Sure. And as I started writing it, it just got sillier and sillier because I'm a jackass at heart. And it just, it, you know, it, it, it went where it went. And, but I had so much fun writing it. And, um, you know, it's people who like um, movies like Basket Case and uh, and you know silly things like that. Maybe Killer Clowns. It's it's kind of like that. And you know, one of the reviews a guy said um, it was like if Troma made a, an episode of Black Mirror. And I don't that's know if awesome. that's a compliment. I think I think I think he meant that as a compliment. So. Oh hell yeah, that's a compliment. If, if you're getting compared to anything Troma, you know, with Uncle Lloyd over there, you're definitely doing something right. So I definitely respect that. And from what I've read, like you said, I love your sense of humor. I love the dark humor that you're doing with this. I think it's amazing. Um, now I know that you just submitted your other books, but is there anything you can tell us about them, or is everything kind of under wraps with those? Yeah, I, you know, I, I I just submitted the the novel to my my current publisher, and um, so we, you know we'll see if they want to you know what they want to do with it. But it's um. You know, the, it's called the Cain Consequence, and okay. the idea behind it, it was the original idea that sparked it was, I don't know if you're familiar with this thing called the Mandela Effect. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah, uh, yeah I, 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 you know, somebody turned me on to this, this idea of the Mandela Effect, and I went down this rabbit hole, and it just sparked an idea for, for me, so that's why it's called the Cain Consequence. And oh, the uh, Berenstein so Bears, it's, it's a, man. Oh, it, it's, it's, you know, I don't know how much of it is real, how much of it's in our minds, but the, the whole idea of um, large groups of people misremembering the same event, people that have nothing in common with each other, just blows my mind. So I, I just, I ran with that idea and, um, and you know, that, that's really, that was like the spark for it. It has a lot of the humor like, like, like Demon does, um, but it's a bit more of a serious book. It's a full length novel. And um, so it's, it's a bit more of a serious work, but it definitely has a lot of my, you know, strange humor to it as well. And I do want to add real quick, I've never met anyone in 35 years of my life that has called them the Berenstain Bears. I just want to throw that out there. Everybody has always called them the Berenstain Bears. So for me, that's what they've always been. I agree. I, 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 you know, some of it, some of it, you know, some of that stuff you could just, you could, you could say, well, it's just people parroting things and, you know, and then other things just kind of blow my mind. So. That's what gave me the idea for, for the, the, the newest novel. So it's called The Cane Consequence. And uh, I hope it comes out soon, but we'll see. So do I. Um, so, my friend, we know what you're doing in the future with The Cane Consequence. We know what you're doing right now with The Demon, The Dumbwaiter, and The Douchebag. And like I said, guys, all his social media, as well as links to order the book, are down here in the description. I would strongly recommend it. Like he said, it's definitely like an episode of, you know, if Troma made a, a short episode, this would be it. <laughs> So it's something that if that's your sense of humor, I think you'll really dig this. I've been tearing into it and I'm having a whole lot of fun with it. But now, my friend, I want to go back to the past, Sal. And I want to talk about what got you started in the horror genre, your first horror movie. And your first horror movie was? Salem's Lot. What a great start to a horror life, man. Um, it's a good This is a movie that they're re I believe they're remaking it either as a, a full-length feature or a TV show right now. And I'm very excited for that. Um, do you remember how old you were the first time you seen it? Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, I got quite a few years on you. So um, I saw it in real time when it came out. So that was what, 79. So I was 10. Man. So this is a movie that has withstood the test of time. I still have people to this day that debate that Salem's Lot could possibly be one of King's best works. And it's hard to argue that. This is a great film. It's a great novel. So do you remember um, who you were with the first time you've seen Salem's Lot? You know, I... This is, it's a great little story and I don't want to yap too much, but, um, you know, I remember it was, it, it's, my mom was a, um, a first generation Stephen King reader. So okay. from the time that I was like a little, little kid, 
you know, my mom right off the bat, Carrie and all that stuff. And she was like, um, you know, yeah, this writer, Stephen King. And obviously I couldn't read it. You know, I was a little kid. Um, but, I, but, you know, by the time 79, when Salem's Lot came out, I was just, I was totally ready to see it. Now I should preface this by saying that I've seen before Salem's Lot, I had seen all the um, Universal Monster movies, but I don't consider those, you know, horror movies. To me, they were superheroes. You know, I used right. to play with my friends in the backyard and they'd bring Superman dolls and Spider-Man dolls and I would have, you know, my, my Creature from the Black Lagoon. They, they were just superheroes to me. I never thought of it as, as horror movies, you know? So um, so I remember Salem's Lot was, you know, coming out and um, I'll never forget, uh, you know, again, this is 79, so we had one TV in the house. And um, my dad was like, I'm not watching that shit. Uh, and my mom was going next door to have coffee with the neighbor because in the 70s, that's what you did on a Wednesday at nine o'clock, you had coffee, you know? And uh, she said, yeah, they said you can come over and watch it. So my brother and I, my brother was eight, I was 10. We went over there and we watched it. And I'll never forget about three quarters of the way through the, you know, the first episode, right? It was two episodes. The first episode, my dad called the next door neighbor and said, he's done with the TV, we should come home. So my mom said, okay. Next commercial break, you guys go home. And I'll never forget, you know, the commercial hit. And I, I, I'm pretty sure the scene when the commercial hit was when the kid comes out of the coffin and bites the guy. And my mom said, okay, you can go home. And it was dark out. And I, I'll tell you this, man, the probably from my neighbor's door to my door took about eight seconds. It was the longest eight seconds of my life. And we walked in the house. My brother and I were falling all over each other, falling down. My dad, what the hell is going on here? You know, and that, I mean, it, it just devastated me. Right. And this is one of those things where, um, like you said, this is one of those Stephen King episodic things that just like it, just like um, Rose Red, just like the Langoliers, this wasn't one that you just watched in the movie theater. So this is a movie. And like, I can't imagine being a little kid running home in the dark, trying to get back home before I, I could watch True. the next part. Um, so we talked about who you were with. And now Salem's Lot, it's a very long movie, but it's a passionate movie. And it has a lot of scenes that have, like I said, withstood the test of time that we all talk about. Which scene do you think it was that affected you the most? Yeah, I mean, it has to be the kid Danny Glick at the window, scratching at the window. Uh, you know, I, I still to this day, I mean, if you watch it, it is, and if you talk to people my age, I mean, they, they all say the same thing. You know, that, that moment was just, you know, I, you know, Toby Hooper, right, directed it, and um, what a job, man, with the smoke, and, and I don't know, it, it was just, the kid floating at that window, it, it just had such a surreal feel to it, um, and yet, you know, Toby Hooper, when he directed it, he, um, you know, Sam's Lot is not very glossy, It's and I guess we shouldn't be surprised, right, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's, it's very cold and, and stark, and it just, I don't know, to me, it just felt very real, it just, the whole thing just felt very real. And it's funny because whenever people think of Toby Hooper, they think of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like you just said. But, I mean, we have Salem's Lot. And I totally consider Poltergeist a Toby Hooper movie, not a Spielberg movie. And, you know, these are all movies that really affected my childhood that I grew up watching that I fell in love with. And I think Toby Hooper is probably one of the most underrated horror directors of all time. Um, what he did with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that's – I sound weird saying this, but that's a beautiful movie. The way that movie shot, the way that things are in that movie, the art department did a great job. Toby Hooper made a beautiful slasher movie with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He made a beautiful possession movie with Poltergeist. And this is a beautiful vampire story. And I don't even know if you want to call it a vampire story, but man, Salem's Lot is one of these films that, like you said, when you see that kid or the thing opening its eyes, you know, those are the things that always stuck with me as a little boy. Um, so we know which scene affected you the most, Sal, but what would you say your favorite scene from Salem's Lot is? You know what? Hands down, my favorite scene is um, when Barlow comes through the window. And, and still to this day, I, I don't exactly know what the hell happened. Because, like, you know, the window is about yay big. I mean, it's, it's this little window. It smashes. And then there's that cloak on the floor. And then he rises from the cloaks. I don't know. if he, Was he a bat? Was he, you know, what was he when he came through that window? We still don't know. But, man, I mean, he just, when he rises and you see him, and then he clunks the parents' heads together like he's Mo and, and, and the Three Stooges. And they, they drop dead. And, right. uh, you know, and uh, his, his keeper is... Got that whole monologue, you know, I mean, that scene. And again, it, it, it's like that, that realism and that starkness. It's not in dark. You know, that whole kitchen is lit up. I mean, we yeah. see it. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just, and you know, you, you'd think that that shouldn't work. I mean, it, it, you know, I don't know. If I were directing it, I don't know anything about directing. I would think you'd have to have some shadow. And yet right. he did it, and it was completely bright. And, and 
for all intents and purposes, that scene should not work. And it's, it's incredible. And what's another thing that you're talking about right now, I think it takes a whole lot more work to scare me in the light. Um, when you can have a, like one of the movies I talk about a lot is Midsommar. Um, the whole movie is in the day and it's a terrifying movie to watch. You, if you can make me scared while I'm watching something in the daytime, you've definitely done your mm -hmm. job the right way. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I just, I love it. And, you know, I just have to say, you're talking about Hooper, <clears throat> you know, my favorite, and I'll probably get a lot of hate for this. <clears throat> my favorite Texas Chainsaw is Pop 2. I love oh, that movie. I, I, I love one. Don't get me wrong. Texas Chainsaw 1 is a, is a bona fide classic, but I love Texas Chainsaw 2 and a lot of people hate it and I don't get it. I've, I've always been a bigger fan of horror comedy. I think it's because my first horror movie was House from 1986. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. So I've always gravitated more towards horror comedy. So I think that's why I like Texas Chainsaw 2 more. But after that, I think that franchise goes right down. Like, I think oh, that's yeah. where. Like, but again, with Texas Chainsaw 2, it's still scary. Like, I don't want a movie oh, yeah. that's just complete comedy with a little bit. Because it has the horror name, then they consider it a horror movie. I want you to be able to scare me too. Just because you're using the moniker of Texas Chainsaw, don't make me a comedy movie and then just throw Texas Chainsaw on there and say, well, it's a horror movie because it's a Texas Chainsaw movie. Texas Chainsaw 2 didn't do that. They were able to scare you at the same time. Yeah, I mean, more than a comedy, it's just batshit crazy. I mean, that, yeah. that's the beauty of that movie. But yeah, you're right. I mean, there were there scenes in that movie where, you know, the first time I saw it, um, you know, Bill Mosley's character, like, terrified. Stop, stop. The first time I saw the Texas Chainsaw 2, I'm like, this guy is completely insane. I mean, yeah, I really don't want to run into in an alley at night. No. <laughs> so, Sal, we talked about the first horror movie that got you started in the horror genre. But now for a second, man, I want to throw you a curveball. I want to go scream on you here for a second. What's your favorite scary movie? What is your favorite horror movie of all time? Oh, man. I'm sure you get this all the time, but people like that have a tough time answering it. I mean, I have, you know, I have my usual suspects, things like, um, you know, like The Exorcist and Jaws, the, you know, those are those are movies that I absolutely love. But when I think of like my favorite, one of the criteria for me is it has to be the kind of thing that I that I can watch over and over again. Sure. And you know, I'm not always in the mood to watch The Exorcist, right? So um, I, I, if it really push came to shove, I'd have to say it's uh, Evil Dead Two. You know, that that's got to be the one. I could watch that every six months and never get tired of it. Evil Dead 2, to me, is as close to a perfect movie besides A Nightmare on Elm Street that you can get. Um, like I said, I've grown up more with horror comedy, and Evil Dead 2 is the perfect horror movie to me. It's got horror, it's got comedy, it makes you laugh, it makes you scared, it makes you anxious. Um, there's just It's such a perfect movie. So, um, Sal, before I let you go, we always end this with the same question, my friend. We always end it with a skull count. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to Salem's Lot, and we're ranking this movie on a skull count, zero skulls being the worst and five being the best. We're not being critics here, Sal. We're not ranking it on acting, production, anything like that. We're ranking this movie strictly on what it means to you and how much it affected you. So zero to five skulls. You can use half and quarter skulls. What would your ranking of Salem's Lot be? Um, I'd have to go four and a half. And I, I don't blame you at all because, like I said, you made it from your neighbor's door to your door in eight seconds. That shows a huge effect on you as a young boy. So, um, everybody, uh, I, like I said at the beginning, I want to remind everybody, make sure you're clicking the links down here in the description. Make sure you're checking out the book. And not only that, but you're checking out sales social media because he's going to have so many more things coming up here in the future. Um, one thing I want to add before we go, make sure, guys, that you are getting your COVID vaccine because um, it's a lot better to get it and have the vaccine then not get it and have the vaccine. So make sure you're taking care of yourself. Make sure that you are staying healthy for not only yourself, but the people around you. And if this offends you, I'm so sorry, but I have my personal beliefs. I hope that you can respect that. And I hope that you can respect the fact that I'm caring about everybody around me. I have three children that I have to think about every day. That's my job now. You know, I love Sledgehammer Horror. I love working at a park store. I love being a husband, but being a father is the number one thing to me. So I got to do whatever I can to keep these kids safe. So I hope you guys feel the same way. Get your vaccine, kick this thing's ass so we can get back to doing the normal things that we always do. Uh, keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.